Good morning, everybody. I'm Rob Swerd from Robart Electrical Services. Um, I guess we may as well get started. It's a couple of minutes after 10. Thank you, one and all, for coming out and um, viewing my presentation. Looks like I don't have a lot of light on my face, but um, you guys get the gist of it anyway. Just to give you a little bit of information about Robart Electric and why we're doing this, um, I started doing this presentations probably about 12 years ago. I would come out to the broker's offices and I would sit in front of you and do these presentations. What this is, is these are seminars to help you understand residential electrical. Everything from 60 amp services to basements without permits and so forth. So about 12 years ago, we started this adventure together and we've been going to all of the offices and I've spoken in front of hundreds of, of realtors and we've had a lot of great success. Because of this, we've created a number of tools that you guys have available to you to help you close uh, deals and so forth. But we're gonna be talking about those pretty soon. Let's get started. 2021 Realtor and Inspector Residential Electrical Training. This is, um, this is the training that I've been given over the years, and this has been updated with a couple new things. Let's get an overview of what we're gonna be talking about today. 60 amp residential electrical services is a big one. We're gonna be talking about aluminum wiring, we're going to be talking about things that you guys don't come across very often, and that's basements without electrical permits. We're going to talk a little bit about legal suites and what's going on with that today. Now, we're going to get into the tools that were developed for you, and uh, one of them was negotiations pending and you need a quote. That was huge uh, over the years, and it proved to be an incredible good tool for you to use. And next we get into inspectors found electrical problems. How can Robart Electric help you out with those kind of problems? Some things we're gonna talk about are FPE, Federal Pioneer uh, Black Breakers. What's going on with those and so forth and why you need to be concerned. We're gonna talk about ongoing support for you in your daily uh, dealings and so forth. And then the big new one that we just finished developing a couple months ago called the library. Let's get started. Very first thing we're gonna talk about is 60 amp residential electrical services. Insurance concerns. The insurance companies are very concerned about this because they feel that a 60 amp electrical service is um, a concern for the threat of a claim. Now I had an opportunity to talk to an underwriter for the Insurance Bureau of Canada a number of years ago. And I asked him the question, I says, why are you guys imposing this idea of upgrading services on all buyers of older homes? I says, you know, how many, you know, how many claims have there been over the years uh, because of 60 amp services? And what he told me the answer was, was zero. They have never had a claim regarding electrical services. And what it is, is they're doing this in the interest of relinquishing the chance of having claims. So it's, it's all set up by the insurance companies. It's got nothing to do with the city of Edmonton or electrical code or anything like that. So that's what the concern is with the insurance companies. Identification of 60 amp services. When you guys finish today's course, you're gonna be able to walk into the backyard of an older home and tell immediately if it's a 60 or a 100 amp service. I'm gonna help you identify that. Then we're gonna get into uh, quick quotes, which is one of the tools we set up. And then we're gonna get into um, legal service upgrades. Okay, very first thing that we're gonna talk about is there's three things that you need to identify in order to determine if it's a 60 or a 100 amp electrical service. The very first thing is no main breaker. You guys can see here on the pictures in this federal pioneer on the left, 
there's no main breaker up above the standard breakers. And the one beside it, the red one, the square D panel, there is no main breaker. And on the bottom right hand side, the um, other panel, which is a Bulldog Pushmatic, there's no main breaker up above. These are the things you're looking for. I'd like to explain something to you that might be just for clarification. A number of years ago, the city of Edmonton decided they were going to let electrical contractors come into a home, change the electrical panel and not change the outside equipment. What they had determined was we're, we're giving them a 100 amp service panel with a 100 amp main breaker, but everything outside was still 60. So they changed that. Today, you are not allowed to change any part of an electrical service unless you upgrade the complete service. So that's today. Now let's figure out what a 100 amp main breaker is. On the end of the handle of the big breaker, there's a number that will say 60, 70, or 100. That's usually at the top of the panel. Again, what you're looking for is the existence of a 100 amp main breaker. Now, unfortunately, because of those years where they were allowed to change panels, you can find a 100 amp main breaker in a shiny brand new panel, but the outside is still 60 amps. But here's where we talk about the other two aspects of identifying the service. One thing I found really, really funny, I think it was probably back in uh, 2009 or 2008 when I started this, was I was getting some realtors coming to me and we were talking about 100 amp and 60 amp services. And they said to me, they says, well, Rob, it's a 100 amp service because it says so on the electrical panel. So if you take a look at an electrical panel, it's got a sticker. And on that sticker, it says 120, 240 volt, 100 amp. What that is, is that's the manufacturer's recommended maximum current you can put into that piece of equipment. It's got absolutely nothing to do with the size of the electrical service. 100 amp panels have been in existence since early 1940s, when they started doing overhead services that were bigger than 35 amps. So don't be fooled by looking at the sticker. The next portion that you've got to be watching out for is what's called the weather. Hood. Somebody's playing some music. All right, thank you. <laughs> Um, the next thing you got to watch out for is the weather head. The weather head is that pipe that's sitting on the back of the house, and it is the one that connects to the wires coming from the alley. You can see in the pictures that the one on the left, the weather head is on a flat wall directly above the meter socket. And on the one on the right, that one is underneath the soffits. Both of these are 60 amp service rated. What you're looking for nowadays are the ones that go up through the roof. The height of that meter socket must be 12 foot four. Okay, that's what we're looking for. So now the first thing we needed to watch for was the 100 amp main breaker. The second thing was the weather head. The third thing you're looking for when you go into a home and you're trying to identify if it's a 60 amp service is the meter socket. The meter socket is that metal box that the glass meter plugs into. It plugs into the metal box. The picture on the left is a round meter socket, brown in this case, color means nothing, but that is 60 amp rated according to EPCOR and the city of Edmonton. The one in the middle is a square box. This was normally put in by EPCOR um, in porches, uh, the back porch of a house and so forth, because it didn't need to be outside. And again, it's got the round, uh, in this case, acrylic meter plugged into it. The third one, the one on the right, again, is a round 60 amp um, meter socket with the glass meter plugged into it. 
So now everybody, we've got three things we're looking for. You're looking for a 100 amp main breaker in the main electrical panel. You're looking for the weather head to be above the roof or 12 foot four on a flat two-story wall. And the third thing you're looking for is the meter socket. But the meter socket must be rectangular, not square or round. Not sorry, yeah, not square or round. So that's the three things you're looking for. If you find one, that doesn't mean it's a 60, 100 amp service. All three must be true. Guys, I created this document back in, in, in 2008 or 2009. What this is, is I laminated this and I handed it out at all my training seminars for all the realtors. This is a quick guide that um, will tell you exactly what you're looking at. In the top left-hand corner, there's a picture of a red panel that doesn't have a main breaker. In the bottom left-hand corner, that's a federal pioneer that does have a main breaker up top. Again, what you're looking for is 100 amps to be written on the handle, not, um, not anything else. You could find anything from 60 to 70 also written there. The middle set of pictures, the top one is of course, that brown meter socket that is 60 amp rated. And the bottom one is a typical rectangular 100 amp meter socket. So that's one, the main breaker, two, the meter socket, and number three is the weather head. The weather head in the top picture is underneath the soffits. In the bottom picture, it's above the roof. The bottom picture is what you're looking for. Before we go on any further, does anybody have any questions about 60 amp service identification? Everybody's good? Wonderful. Okay, let's move on. Some things I've got to remember to tell you about this. <clears throat> A number of years ago, I got a phone call from a realtor who said the homeowner called Epcor and asked Epcor, do I have a 100 amp service for my house? Epcor said, yes. The realtor came back to me and said, Rob, why are you scamming us trying to tell us it's a 60 amp service when Epcor says it's 100? I got quite the kick out of that because what it is is Epcor supplies the wire that goes from the alley across the yard to the house and connects to the weatherhead. They always, since the 40s, put in a 100, 100 amp capable piece of wire to bring power to the house. So when you ask Epcor, what's the power service coming to my house? They're gonna tell you 100 amp and that's why. But when in actuality, You've got a, a no main breaker. The wiring on the house is only rated for 60 amp and the equipment is rated for 60 amp, but Epcor says it's a 100 amp service. So don't be fooled by that. The panel changed, but not the rest. We talked about that and what that was, was years ago, like I say, the city was allowing us to go in and change electrical panels, but not the remaining service, which now has been changed. Now, whenever you guys go into a backyard and you're looking at the electrical to identify if it's a 60 or 100, you'll come across the glass meter. The glass meter has to be between five and five foot six on the wall. Now, one question I always get asked a lot of is, what happens if they build a deck? Now, you've got a glass meter on the back wall of this old 1950s house and they go and build a three foot deck. Now, all of a sudden you go up the deck and you've got this glass meter that's only two feet above the uh, floor of the deck. And the question was, where do you take a measurement to determine if this is proper? And the answer is you take the measurement from your feet. You stand in front of the meter, you take the measurement from your feet. So if you're standing on a three or four foot deck, and you want to give your client information about this, measure from your feet to the middle of the glass. What you're looking for is about five and a half feet. 
Everybody's okay on that? No questions? Question. Okay. Yes, go ahead, Nicole. Um, can, I just missed the portion when you were saying, what are we measuring five and a half feet up to? My apologies. That's okay, no problem. The, the height requirement for a meter is five foot to five foot six. Now, if you're speaking with your client and you're going over different aspects of the house and you notice that a deck was built, now the standard meter would now be probably about two feet off the deck because the height of the deck. But where you measure from is your feet. So if you're walking around with your client, you go up the stairs to the deck, you're standing on the deck and you look down and there's a glass meter, that's something that you can bring to their attention because you know that the home inspector who I've also trained is going to know about this and bring it up as a deficiency. Wonderful, that's, thank you. You're very, very welcome. That's something that EPCOR is concerned about because of the safety of their readers. But having said that, that is now a statement that is no longer true, but they haven't changed the height requirement because EPCOR doesn't have meter readers anymore. About two years ago, all of the glass meters have been changed to the plexiglass, which are now digital. All of the readings, all of the consumption and everything is now read from downtown at somebody's computer. They don't have people walking around anymore. So uh, next one on the list is, I, I wanna tell you about, it says EPCOR takes too long and you need help. What this is, is I heard a lot of times from realtors that there was quick, uh, quick sales where it was fast tracked and the buyers wanted the house in 30 days. Well, nowadays with the insurance companies, they don't want to insure a 60 amp service. So what the insurance companies have done over the last couple of years is they've said, okay, we're gonna give you 90 days to get the service upgrade. This is to the new buyers. They're giving them 90 days to get the service upgrade or they're saying they're not going to insure the house because they don't want the liability. Or the third thing is they're telling them that um, they can have insurance. Oops, missed one, sorry. They can have insurance, but it's gonna be astronomically priced. So there's three different things that are gonna to happen to your buyers when they come in and look at this house. Now, underground services. Somebody says to me, is an underground service 60 amps? Underground services came out approximately 1968, 69, 70. Underground services are always a minimum of 100 amps. Overhead can be anywhere from 35 amps back in the 20s and 30s to 60 amp. The overhead services can also be 100 because that came out about 1963 or 1964. But what we use as a rule of thumb is anything 1965 and prior could be a 60 amp service. Everybody okay with that or was I talking too fast? Good, let's move on. Any more questions about 60 amp service identification? Again, guys, you guys can go to the library and I'll explain that to you in a few minutes and get a copy of that document that has the pictures on it. Wonderful, let's move on. Aluminum wiring. Does anybody know when aluminum wiring was prevalent? Okay. Who said, yes, what? The 70s? Yes. So when did it start? Any idea? 1972. Nine, that's right, 1968. Good for you. 1968 to approximately 1975. I like that. 1975, give or take a year. But I have found aluminum as early as 1978. Sorry, 1968. Because uh, at Robart Electric, we do the aluminum pigtailing and we usually do about 50 of them a year minimum. So what we get a lot of opportunity to take a look at this. But let's talk about aluminum wiring. The pictures that you guys are seeing, I'm gonna tell you stories about this, but let's start off with an explanation of what aluminum wiring problem is. 
Aluminum wiring, the problem is what's called cold flow. Cold flow is the compression of aluminum under a screw. Now, let me ask you, where is the wire for electrical compressed under a screw? It's on the side of a plug or a switch. When we do repairs to aluminum wiring, we do not concern ourselves with light fixtures. And why is that? Because there's no aluminum compressed under a screw in a light fixture. And the insurance company doesn't care about um, the light fixtures because they take such little power. Okay, so that's what, that's what cold flow is. Somebody asked me one day, they said, Rob, the home inspector was just here. And the home inspector says, oh my God, run for the hills. There's aluminum wiring. And the buyers freaked out and they walked out. The seller's realtor called me and said, what the hell? What is this? And what it is, is this home inspector didn't have a clue of what he was talking about. Because what he told the buyers was, all of the walls have to be opened, all of the wiring taken out, and all copper put in. That is absolutely false. There's nothing wrong with aluminum wire. It is the second, third best conductor to be used for residential wiring. What the problem is, is cold flow, the compression under a screw. So don't be fooled by inspectors who come in freaked out like that. Let me tell you something about the cold flow also, just so I can explain what this is. When you compress a piece of aluminum wire under the screw on the side of a plug or a switch, what happens is it, when you draw electricity through it, it heats up. Copper doesn't do that. Aluminum heats up. When it heats up, it expands and contracts, expands, contracts, expands, contracts, and it loosens under the screw. When it loosens under the screw, it starts to arc. When it starts to arc, it starts to overheat. So now let me explain something to you. On the picture you're seeing in the top right hand corner, that receptacle with all the burn marks on the wall. I got a phone call from a guy. He says, Rob, I smell something burning in my basement. I says, oh yeah. He says, yeah, really, come take a look. So I went down and there was this great big long rumpus room wall. And there was a plug-in over there, a plug-in over there and a bookcase. So I said to this guy, I says, is there a plug-in behind that bookcase? He says, I don't know. I says, let's move the bookcase and see. This is what we found behind the bookcase. Somebody had gone in and changed the original receptacle to a beautiful white decora, but they didn't tighten the screw fully. And because it was aluminum, it started to arc. It arced, it melted the plug, and it burnt the wall. Needless to say, he asked Robart Electric to go through the complete house and check all of the wiring. The next one, let's talk about, I want you guys to know all these. Bottom, uh, bottom left-hand side on the page. I got a call from a realtor and the realtor says, Rob, I got these buyers. They're looking at this 1972 house and they just love it. But the home inspector found aluminum wiring. And, and, the, and the seller said, oh, no, no, chikai, chikai, it's okay. Uncle Dave was here two weeks ago. He pigtailed everything. So the realtor and the buyer says to me, well, Rob, we don't really feel comfortable with this. Can you come down and check? So I went down and I use a thing called thermography. I'll show you this coming up right away. But we use a thing called thermography to check for heat. So I went around, I was checking some of the receptacles and all that sort of stuff. And what I found was by the back door, there was three switches. Behind the three switches, it looked really hot in the thermography. So I took off the cover plate. I took out the center switch and that bottom picture on the right hand side is what I found behind the switch. Uncle Dave did that two weeks ago. I'm going to give you a statement that is absolutely true. If you get pigtailing done, which is what is required to fix this, and we're going to talk about pigtailing. If you get pigtailing done, if it's done incorrectly, 
you increase the risk of fire. And that is a prime example of what Uncle Dave did because he didn't know how to do it. I'm going to tell you something. Robart Electric is the only company I know of that when we do aluminum corrections, we take out an electrical permit. The reason for this is the city of Edmonton will send an unbiased electrical inspector to come down and check our work. He will give a report saying that Robart Electric used the proper procedures to do the aluminum wiring. Aluminum wiring pigtailing removes the risk of fire. It removes the risk of fire, which is all you're concerned about, right? Okay, let's talk about this a little bit further. Insurance company safety inspection requests. This is fun because two, three years ago, the insurance company started calling uh, people with homes pre-1980. And they were saying to them, they wanted uh, a journeyman electrician to come in and do an inspection on the wiring of the house and produce a report that says the wiring was safe. I was doing a seminar for the underwriters at AMA a few years ago, and I talked to the top underwriter and I says, what the heck? What's with these things that you're asking the, the homeowners to give? He said, he pulled me off to the side and he says, what this is, is the insurance companies are relinquishing responsibility. And in a stupefied look, I, I said, what does that mean? He says, well, if you get the homeowner to get a journeyman electrician to come in, pay him for the inspection, of course, get him to come in, do an inspection of the house. He gives the report. If there should be a fire, heaven forbid, the insurance company will pay 100% for the insurance claim on this house. But if they've got that piece of paper that says the house was safe by a journeyman electrician, guess what happens next? They sue the journeyman and get all their money back. So when you come across a client who's selling a house and they say that they got this report, this uh, request for a report from the insurance company, now you know what it's all about. The only way to fix is number three on this aluminum wiring list. <coughs> Excuse me. In the bottom left-hand corner, bottom right-hand corner, is a picture of what we do for what's called pigtailing. Now I'm gonna make a statement right now that's absolutely true. If you Google aluminum wiring correction or aluminum wiring um, made safe or whatever, you're gonna get four different methods of doing correction to aluminum wiring. I've done a lot of research over the years. The other three being a special marette another a tightened down type of uh, adapter and so forth. None of those are acceptable to the US government or the Canadian government as being something that works. The only thing that works, and my house, was in 1991, I pigtailed everything in my house and I have never had a symptom show up because of aluminum wiring. But anyway, aluminum wiring, pigtailing. This is where we go in. There's aluminum wiring hanging out of the electrical box. We attach a piece of copper to the aluminum wire and it's that piece of copper that gets attached under the screws of a plug or a switch. Now what is happening is we've removed cold flow because there is no more aluminum being compressed under the screw. But there's a number of strategic things that Uncle Dave obviously didn't do that must be done. There's an antioxidizing compound that must be put on. And also there's a special kind of moret that you put on to the wires so that they, you don't get oxidization. And the third thing you need to do is you now need a new plug or switch that's rated for copper because you, you're taking the aluminum away. Those three things must be true. If you do it wrong, you increase the risk of fire. This is why we take out an electrical permit 
because now the inspector is telling your client it is done correctly and you don't have to worry. If I'm sleeping in the house, I want to make sure that my family and pets are all safe. That's what it is with the Illumina. Electrical permit to guarantee safety. That's what we just talked about. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Here's a really neat picture. I like this. I found, I found this when we were out doing a pigtailing job. And what this is, is all of those wires that are melted are all aluminum. The guy that installed this didn't put any antioxidizing compound or he didn't tighten down the screws. You can see that all of them started overheating. It's that type of thing that is the beginning of a fire. I spoke with you about a thing called thermography. Thermography is a special camera, actually, that I attach to my phone. And I can walk around with my phone like this, and I can go around and I can check plugs and switches to see if there's anything that's overheated. I found this one at a, a home that I went to that had aluminum wiring. The renovation, the, the customer did his own pigtailing. It was done three weeks prior during a renovation they did. So here's another example just to show you that if you do it incorrectly, you increase the risk of fire. Because what happens with this is the, is the device starts melting, the wire insulation melts, and all of a sudden it gets back to the a wooden two by four that the box is attached to, and that's what starts the fire. Are there any questions about aluminum wiring? I have a question. Yes. So I understand that the problem is the cold flow. And I, uh, you said that you guys pull a permit for all the all pigtails so that you get um, so that you have a city inspector come take a look at it. That makes yeah. sense to me. Often in our transactions, as I'm sure you know, is a buyer finds out it's aluminum wiring. For some reason, we couldn't tell before. We find out it's aluminum wiring. Uh, the possession date, there's often not enough time to get the seller to do that because the inspections can take weeks. So that's in a perfect world. I would love those permits, but um, I assume you write like a letter saying, I, you know, I have uh, pigtailed this property and can we take that letter? And then, I mean, we can't pull a permit after the fact. So I guess just what do you do for realtors who have a possession that's upcoming? We just negotiate you to fix it then. Okay. In a case like that, what we do guys is um, when we in, when we find out that there's aluminum wiring, uh, let me walk you through the steps. First of all, I got to give you a quotation to get this done. I do so many of these, I don't have to come to the house. I just have to ask you questions like, is it a bungalow or a two-story? Is there an attached or detached garage? How many square feet? Those are the things I need to know to be able to put together a quotation. I send out the quotation, your client accepts by replying saying, I accept the quote, please proceed with the project. Once they do that, that to me is just like a signature. When we get that piece of paper, you as the realtor need to come to me and say, Rob, we've got possession in two weeks, we need this done. That's no problem because what we do is we manipulate our schedule to make sure that we get in there on time before the possession. Now, as far as the city of Edmonton, the permits and the inspector, the inspectors have not been going out to do visual inspections because of COVID. So what we're doing with the city of Edmonton is what's called a uh, VRI, visual, uh, no, a video inspection, video, regard, regard sorry, <laughs> video inspection. We do video connections with the inspectors so that they can see what we're doing and they will approve it based on what they're seeing because they're only looking for the three things to make sure it's done properly. So we can get the inspectors to do this. Now that COVID is coming closer to an end, they are starting to do inspections. But when we're done a pigtailing job, as, a, as the client and as the realtor, you get three things. You get an invoice from Robart Electric saying who did the work, 
what was done and so forth. You get a copy of the City of Edmonton electrical permit and you get a copy of the inspector's report. For the last 10, 15 years of doing pigtailing, those three pieces of paper have never been refused by the insurance companies. So does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, it does, thank you. You're welcome. Now, one thing I wanted to mention also is in the insurance companies, if they find aluminum wiring, they're um, very, very, very up on this now. They're refusing insurance or of course, like service upgrades, they're giving you 90 days to get it done. But what they're doing is they're giving you an interim insurance at uh, a very high price because of the threat of fire. If you do not have um, pigtailing done, for instance, you're working on behalf of the seller, the seller would have been paying a premium as part of their home insurance premium cost because of the aluminum wiring. Once the pigtailing is done, your insurance rate should go down because they no longer need that premium on there. Everybody's good with that? Wonderful. Let's talk a little bit about things you guys never come across. Finished basements with no electrical permits. I know some of you are giggling because that's a daily thing, basically. I would venture to say, guys, that 95% of the basements done in Alberta are not done with electrical permits because of the fact you can buy a book, you can go online, and it's very, very explanatory about how to do wiring. So people don't want to hire electricians, they don't want permits and so forth, they go and do their own wiring. You would not believe the scary things I've found going behind somebody who's done their own wiring. But that's another huge story. Anyway, finished basements with no permits. You get a buyer, and this happens to me a lot. You get a buyer that comes in, and I've been training home inspectors also. If there's a basement and it looks like it's been renovated in the last number of years, go to the electrical panel and see if there's a sticker from the city of Edmonton regarding that basement. It's going to say basement renovation on the sticker. That is the inspector's sticker. That means that there was a permit taken out. If there was no permit taken out on that basement, let me explain, I'm gonna try and be brief because I know we're up to 40 minutes already. Let me explain to you what happens. First of all, normally a homeowner can take out their own permit. There's no problem at all. It's called a homeowner's permit. They can do their own wiring, then have an inspector come in. But most people don't. Once the basement is finished and it's drywalled, the homeowner cannot take out a permit because a homeowner requires two inspections. One for the rough-in stage, which is prior to drywall, and the second one for finishing. Because it's drywall, they cannot do the rough-in stage, so the homeowner cannot take out a permit. So now if you come in with a buyer that says he wants a permit, this is what has to happen. You contact Robart Electric and you say, Rob, my buyer needs a permit, can you come down? I come down, I must do a complete inspection of the basement to determine what was done. If this basement was done 10 years ago, it will not meet today's code. And, and that means that if I take out a permit, it's gonna fail. So the first step is I gotta come down, look for things like uh, smoke alarms, GFI receptacles, plugs and switches too close to a bathtub, uh, arc fault protection, all that sort of stuff. I make you a list of the deficiencies that are required to bring it up to code. Once those deficiencies are looked after by Robart Electric or Uncle Dave, whoever does it, we need to do another inspection if somebody else does it to determine it was done correctly. Once that's done, Robart Electric can take out the permit, have the inspector come down. Now you, your buyer has a permit. That's the easiest way of doing this. The second way of doing this is an inspection. The buyers normally don't care if it meets code. All they want to know is, is it safe to bring my family into this house? 
and you know be safe about fire and so forth. So we can do an inspection and give you a report as to our findings. Now, like the insurance request, we will never give you a report saying that the basement, finished basement is safe. What we will give you a report on is our findings as to what is a safety concern. Things like GFIs next to sinks, smoke alarms, arc fault protection, which is just something since January 1st, 2016, that will be mentioned. Then we can discuss what needs to be done. The buyers nowadays are looking for this letter. So what we can do is when we generate the letter and the quotation to have this done, when we're completely finished and things have been upgraded, we can generate a letter saying that Robot Electric came in, did the deficiencies, and these are our findings. It's this letter that you give to the buyer, and that usually satisfies them about not having a permit for the basement. Everybody's okay with that? Let me, okay, let me elaborate one more thing about that. About a year ago, the city started something new. When you do anything in your basement, now this is, this is the, the buyers after they take possession. Let's say they want to put in an extra bedroom downstairs. They go downstairs and they figure out that they want to use this space for a bedroom. They're going to be building a few walls, putting in a few plugs and so forth. They must make a drawing and go to the city of Edmonton, take out what's called a building and development permit. A building permit, uh, no, a development permit gives your client the permission to go ahead and do this. The building permit tells them how it's supposed to be done. Now, in the case of a bedroom and so forth, you're gonna have egress through a bedroom window for escape and all those sort of things. But where the trick comes in, as far as electrical is concerned, is nowadays when they go down to the city and apply for the building and development permit, they pay for an electrical permit and they're asked to designate an electrical contractor that that permit gets issued to. So now it's no longer Uncle Dave and they've taken away the right of the homeowner to do it. The homeowner must now delegate an electrical contractor. So this is something that's brand new that you need to be aware of. Is everybody okay with that? Good, thank you. So. What is a finished basement building development permits? Can I get a permit after it's finished? Yes. Now what it says. So I think we've answered all of those questions. Let's talk about the next one. A legal suite. What makes it different? A legal suite is different from you going down and developing rumpus room and all that sort of stuff because now the city knows about it. When you want to develop a suite and call it a legal suite, you've got to make up a drawing go down, get those drawings approved and stamped by the city of Edmonton with their recommendations. They're gonna say things like they want um, uh, independent heat source controllable by the basement people. That can be done by another furnace or baseboard heating. They're gonna talk, talk to you about egress, a bedroom windows for escape. They're gonna talk with you about smoke detectors they're gonna talk with you about fire rating between the furnace and the second floor. All those things make it a legal suite. They're gonna come down and they're gonna do an inspection and generate a list of deficiencies that you, your client needs to address and have done. Once those are done, the basement's finished, an inspector comes back again to give you approval to have your legal suite. You didn't hear this from me, but I think it's a money grab. But anyway, this is what you're doing and this is what the city demands nowadays. Is there, now, it says on there converting existing to illegal. Let's talk about this for a minute. This is really cool. You're acting on behalf of the buyer. You and the buyer come in, take a look at this beautiful house. It's got a nicely finished basement eight, 10 years ago. Your buyers are okay with it. They want to accept it. They buy the house. They take possession. Now what? 
They decide to make another bedroom. They go down for their building and development permit. The very first thing that happens is the guys downtown enter the address of the house and it says that there was never a building and development permit, <clears throat> excuse me, taken out for that residence. What happens now is your new buyers that took possession of this house are now responsible for that existing basement. The city of Edmonton now knows about it. So they're gonna to wanna to do an inspection to find out about window egress, fire ratings, all that sort of stuff. And your buyer, the people who have just put every dime into their uh, deposit for the house, now have to come up with money to cut concrete walls, put in bigger windows, put in smoke alarms and everything, just because the sellers didn't take out a building and development permit. The buyers are liable to take over responsibility for that basement. Is everybody okay with this? No questions? Good, wonderful. Let's move on. This one here is interesting. Negotiations pending and you need a quote. You would not believe how many times at Robart Electric, I get a phone call and they say, Rob, the home inspector was just here with the buyers they found aluminum wiring or they found the 60 amp service. And I'm going into negotiations this afternoon at two o'clock. Can you come down here right now and give me a quotation to do this? That was, those were the words that I used to hear back in 2008, 2009. So what I did was I would go down and I would give them a quotation, take my pictures, take my measurements, blah, blah, blah. All of that happened. And you guys were happy. But then one day, and that's, a, that's an example of uh, the type of quotation we gave out. That's not a problem. So then one day, I got a call from Jason Holland, a realtor, but he asked me not to use his name, so I won't. He calls me on a Saturday morning at nine o'clock and he says, Rob, and we're, we're going through an inspection. The inspector found aluminum, um, found, um, um, a 60 amp service. I need you to come down right now and give me a quote because I'm going into negotiation. So I said, hold it, hold it, hold it. Chikai, chikai, Jason. I can't come down right now. I'm going to send you a quotation. So I went to my computer. So I took the address. I took his client's names and I took the other pertinent information and I generated what's called, what we called a quick quote. And here's a picture of it. It is an actual quotation with a scope of work based on a typical service upgrade. Now on the line where it says total cost of this project, this is an old one. It says 1895 to 2895. That there is the span that the service upgrade will be. Then the word right after that says unseen. The next line says, a site visit is required to determine the scope of work. This was fabulous because Jason took this quote. He went into his negotiations. He had a document from a reputable contractor. He laid it on the table and they closed the deal. It was seamless. So everybody loved this idea of a quick quote. That happened between 2013, 2016, right about in that timeline. But then a couple of realtors got a little fussy with that. And they says, well, you know, Rob, we got a real problem with this because that number scares people away in negotiations. But before I go any further, I want all of you to know something. The number stated in one of our quotations or in a quick quote, you will never, ever, ever pay more than the number stated on our quote or on our quick quote. We do not play the games where we give you half the work quoted and then at the end of the job, come back and say, oh, by the way, the inspector wants us to do this. I need an extra 800 bucks. That will never happen. We stick to our guns and those prices are guaranteed. But anyway, that brought us to 2016. 
Then the realtors were complaining. So this was the next level of um, development. Negotiations pending and we need a quote now. What we started doing was we started doing <coughs> live view in real time. You all have FaceTime, you all have Google Duo, all those sort of things. So now we can have you on site when the inspector arrives and he says, oh, you know, there's a 60 amp service. Or if you know that there's a 60 amp service, call me up, say, Rob, let's do a FaceTime for a quote. You're on site. We both connect up with Google Duo or FaceTime. <clears throat> you show me all the aspects of the electrical service. Show me the meter, show me the wires going to the alley. So I make sure that there's no trees. Show me the meter, the electrical panel, so forth. We have done so many of these. And just to let you know what that means, in a 24 month period, Robart Electric has done over 250 service upgrades. We are the top producers in the city of Edmonton. I'm very, very proud of that. But anyway, so now with you showing me a video of what's existing, I can generate a quotation, send it off to you with a fixed number. And that number will never change. Now, one more thing with that. Thank you so much. Excuse me, guys, just for a second. Oh, you're an angel. Anyway, so that's a fixed number. Now, one thing we're very proud of is we've generated quotations in as quick as eight minutes. That is super impressive. I'm pretty proud of that. But that's something that we're doing nowadays. Let's use Google Duo and FaceTime for me to give you a quote for your negotiations sent out as quickly as we can. Any questions about that tool that was created for you. Good, wonderful. Next. Oh, anyway, here's the example of the quick quote. This has all of the um, scope of work from a typical service upgrade, cost between this and this, unseen, a site visit is required to verify the scope of work. Everything below that says additional options, those are things that I was asked to add because the buyers or sellers were interested in the offer also. That's talking about the breakers, the FPE to get all the breakers in the original panel changed out and a surge protector was the second one. But that, uh, that's a typical quick quote. Okay, a home inspector comes in with the buyers and he's looking around at all the different things. The home inspector finds things like double tapping, burnt wiring, little things like missing covers, wrong breaker size. That's a whole nother topic, that one. Missing smoke detectors, uh, smoke alarms, broken lights, illegal service work, aluminum wiring or knob and tube wiring. One thing I've been doing for you over the years is when the buyers come in and you're with your buyer and the, and the inspector generates this report, I'm having you contact me. And what I do is I take that report, send me the PDF and well, you send me the PDF and I will read it over. I will generate a quotation with the scope of work based on the inspector's findings. Okay, this is, and then I'll generate a quote, send it off to you. This way here, you can go back into negotiations and so forth and have a piece of paper from a reputable company to look after this. Okay, everybody okay with that inspector's report thing? And just to let you know, I do go around to inspectors and so forth giving this seminar in front of all of them. So they know all about the same things you do. So uh, it's, it's a really good thing to deal with. Let's talk about next. Federal Pioneer Stab Block Breakers. These are the ones on the quick quote that says you can replace the breakers. These panels were being put in all the way back to the 1930s. 
You find them normally by the back door of the house or in later years, in the late 50s, early 60s, you'll find them downstairs. But federal pioneer panels are CSA approved. There's millions and millions of them in existence. Now, the problem with FPE, Federal Pioneer Stab Lock, if you go and Google Federal Pioneer Stab Lock Breakers, you're going to find hundreds of articles that say these breakers are known not to turn off when they need to. Okay, so that means if you've got a circuit that overheats, it's not going to turn off and it causes fires. Last year at Robart, we did two fire claims where the electrical wiring burnt down part of the house because the FPE breakers did not turn off. So this is kind of a serious deal. So they overheat, they don't turn off, uh, they cause fires, and there's been no recall. Federal Pioneer did not recall these breakers and um, they've never asked for anything back. So let me describe something to you. If you guys take a look at this picture, you'll see that number six and number seven, number two and number three, the body of the breaker is white. The handles are black. You can see in the top row, number eight, number five, number four, and number one, the body of the breaker is black. The handle is also black. It's the black breakers that they're concerned with. When we come into an existing house to do a service upgrade, most times that little federal pioneer panel that's by the back door, we do not change. And if you want to find out why, we can have a discussion. But the federal pioneer breakers are left in place. So if you come across this now, you can talk to your client and explain what this is. But that's federal pioneer FPE. Any questions? And by the way, all of you people who are sending in questions and comments and all that sort of stuff, I will respond to them after the seminar. Or if you've got something that you feel everybody should know, please jump in when we take the break for questions and let's talk about it. But anyway, let's move on. So that's Federal Pioneer. Let's talk about the realtor tools that we've developed over the, year, over the years to help you guys out. And to date, I think we've got all of them covered because I have not had a realtor in the last five, six years come to me and say, Rob, I need this. I think we've got everything covered. First one is FaceTime quotes. That one is incredibly beneficial for you because we just talked about that. Let's do FaceTime. Let's do Google Duo. Let's get this quote sent out to you. Take a legitimate quote to the table for your negotiations. It makes you look like a superstar. And that's what it's all about. Number two, send in the pictures for, the, for a quote. This is another way we can do it. If you're on site and you don't want to use your data on the phone, call me. I will get you to take specific pictures of certain areas of the electrical service. You can send me those pictures and I can generate a quotation from those. Because in reality, there's probably only 12, 15 different styles of homes that we've done service upgrades on over the years. So once I see what you're dealing with, I kind of know what the system is. Let's talk about number three, inspector's PDF. The home inspector is in there, he finds deficiencies. Call me, send me the PDF. Let me take a look at it. I'll go through every page, generate a scope of work, generate a quotation, send it back to you, use it in negotiations, you're good. Nicely done. Now, here's a good one for you. Number four on this list is letter for the buyer's insurance and mortgage. This is something that comes up usually June, July, August, and sometimes into September. When you get a fast turnover, 30-day possession, we can come in, we can generate the quotation, 
Your seller says, yes, I want Robart Electric to do it. They reply, I accept the quote, please proceed with the project. We immediately call EPCOR and book the next available date to do the service upgrade. Now, I've seen years where it was six or seven weeks for EPCOR to come out and help us with this so we can get the service upgrade done. If you've got a, a buyer who's looking at a possession of 30 days, it's not going to happen before possession. Now, it's going to screw up his insurance and the broker, the mortgage broker, can't give a mortgage if the house isn't insurable. So if the insurance company isn't going to insurance, insure it and the broker's not going to give you a mortgage, then what? And it's all because EPCO is too busy. So what Robart Electric has done is if this happens, once I get the acceptance, I will give you a document that says Robart Electric and the buyer have entered into a contractual agreement for the upgrading of the electrical service from 60 to 100 amp. This will happen on this date as per EPCOR's schedule. If that date is after possession, the insurance company will give your buyer interim insurance so that he can take possession, move into the house, and then get the service upgrade done. Then the mortgage broker can give your buyer a mortgage because now the insurance company has agreed to give insurance based on Robart Electric's letter to the insurance company and the mortgage broker. Ta-da! Another problem solved. This is stuff I used to love dealing with when the, buyer, when the realtors used to come up and give me these problems. We'd always try and figure out the best way of doing it. And it seems to have worked. I'm going to tell you something. Robart Electric, this here, this phone right there, this is the hub from Robart Electric. 238-8195, 780-238-8195. If you call that number, I answer this phone. That statement is actually wrong because it says 24 hour support. I will answer my phone 23 and a half hours a day. So if you call up, you're sitting with a client 10 o'clock at night trying to write up an offer and you've got questions about electrical. What do we do about counter plugs? What do we do about smoke alarms? What do we do about 60 amp service? What do we do with aluminum wiring? If you're sitting there at 10 o'clock at night, call me. I will answer my phone and give you the support. That's why I say I will answer my phone 23 and a half hours a day. So if you call up and I don't answer my phone, that's my half an hour, okay? I'm not gonna answer. Anyway. I want to tell you guys something about this support. Robart Electric, as far as I know, is the only one that answers their phone like we do at these time of, this time of night and everything to help you guys with your client support. This has been invaluable on multiple, multiple occasions of people going into negotiations and so forth. Because I know that you guys don't sleep and you work 24 hours a day so any time of day, you could use this service. So this is why this was set up. Last one is basement safety inspections. This is the thing that we set up a number of years ago. And this is for when there's no permit on a finished basement. We will go in and do the investigation. Like I said, generate the list of safety concerns, not code concerns, safety concerns, give a quotation and present it to your client. You, you are probably thinking to yourself, okay, what's the fee for that? Let's talk about fees while we're on the topic. An investigation of a basement to determine safety issues is $285 plus tax. That's payable by credit card when we're there on site. Then we go off to the office, generate the quote and, and uh, report and send it off to you. While we're on the subject of money, let's talk. Aluminum pigtailing. A couple of you probably have questions that, I, that I'm gonna answer that say, how much is aluminum pigtailing? 
Aluminum pigtailing starts at $1,685 plus a $225 electrical permit. That price of $1,685 covers anything from a 900 square foot townhouse up to about a 1,400 square foot bungalow. If we start getting into the 18, 1900, 22, $2,400, the price will go up, of course, because now I have to send three people out and so forth. But there's a whole bunch more involved with determining the pricing and so forth. If you're curious, call me or email me at uh, rob at robartelectric.com and let's have a discussion. I'm always available to have a discussion with you guys to help you out by answering questions. Is everybody okay? Let's move on. I'm looking at some of these questions. It's gonna be fun. There's a lot of good questions coming in. Next one, inspection service. There it is guys. The inspection service that we provide for $285 plus tax is usually done for aluminum wiring, basements with no permits, illegal service upgrades and so forth. That is being done by a journeyman electrician who is an employee. He's not a subcontractor. Uh, we, don't, we don't go there like some people. So we don't do that. He's one of our employees. He comes out, he checks and so forth. Any questions on inspection services? Good. Next, consultation. I've only had to do this a couple of times, but I'm still offering it because I think it's really, really important for you as realtors to have this available. I've had situations where you get buyers that find there's a 60 amp service or aluminum wiring and they say, oh no, 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 no. I love the house, but I can't deal with that. That's scary. I'm not gonna deal with that. Realtors have called me up and said, Rob, I've got these buyers who are, are love this house, but the aluminum wiring is scaring them. Can you help by offering some advice? So on two occasions, one, I've gone to the person's house. The second one we met at Timmy's and I sat for an hour and I brought documentation and I sat down with the buyers and explained all about the, their concerns, what needs to be done and the safety issues concerning it. On both occasions, the buyers purchased said houses because they then did feel more positive about it. This is another thing that Robot Electric offers you guys as part of this whole package that we've been doing for 12 years to help you guys make sales. Questions? Now the exciting one I get to tell you about. Here it is, the library. I've heard complaints years and years and years <clears throat> that when realtors are in a situation with the buyer or the seller, the inspector leaves and now the buyer says, well, what is it with aluminum wiring? Why do I have to be concerned with this? What's happened in the past is you, the realtor, now act as an electrician. You start presenting information to your buyer the information that you've been given over the years or the information that you've read on Google about let's just say aluminum wiring. That puts you in a situation where you are now legally held accountable for the information that you give that client. Is that right? That's absolutely true. You're not electricians. You shouldn't have to answer these kind of questions. So in the last number of years, it's become more prevalent that it's become a big concern. So what I've done is at a, at a great expense, well, 1600 bucks, that's what it cost me. But at a lot of time and money to put this together, we've developed what's called the library. The library is a source of information for you and your clients. The library was created to let the library speak for you. You're not an electrician, 
So what we've done is we've created this, guys. So now your client says, well, the inspector just left. What is this about aluminum wiring? You now have the ability to say, go to robartelectric.com and on the top band is the spot called the library. You can go in there, your client now goes to the library. They can download PDFs of articles that I've written for newspapers and um, for newspapers and magazines regarding aluminum wiring and that sort of stuff. You know, articles like this, those sort of things. It's all PDFs with pictures and um, they walk through. All the information is there for the typical things that the homeowners and buyers need to know. We are continuously adding to and upgrading the library as more interest comes in for different things. And now that you, um, not, okay. If you know that the topic is not there, if you're going through it, and let me just give you an example. Your client comes in and they wanna buy the house, a hundred amp service, and they say, well, we want to buy a car, electric car, and have a charger. Tell me about that. You as the realtor, in most cases, do not have the ability to answer your client regarding the requirements of a car charger, how it affects 100 amp service, and so forth. This is where you say to your client, go to the library. Go to the library, download all the information. You will be well, well informed. This was designed for your clients and for you. Let me show you briefly what this is. You go into the library and there's an opening video. It's me talking about the library, why it was designed, who it's for, and what you get out of it. You get into the library, it says, welcome to the library, walks you through it, uh, click here to begin. Um, it asks you your name, and I put down Rob. Let's get started with your electrical issues. Are you a home seller, a home buyer, a realtor, or a home inspector? Once you click one of those, it says, nice to meet you. Let's get started. First of all, here's some issues you may want to get um, up to date on. And it starts asking you questions. <clears throat> I'm going into negotiations. This is from the realtor, obviously. I'm going into negotiations and I need a quick quote. When you click on that, it comes up with all the explanations about the tools we just talked about. Finished basement with no permit, can I get one? Can I get a service upgrade before possession? How can I tell if it's a 100 amp service? And then the big question that says, my issue is not listed here. If you click that, <coughs> it says, would you like to download a copy of the document? Yes, no thanks. If you click on your issue is not there, it asks for your email address. That comes directly to my computer. I look at your question, I answer it, and I will send you documentation regarding the topic that you're curious about. Because I have over 100 PDFs written for newspapers and stuff that I can send off to you to help out your clients. This library is invaluable to you because now you don't have to be responsible. You don't have to look like an idiot anymore. It's an added value service for you. Step away, let them go get their own information. Now with this also, your client, if they want a service upgrade, your client can contact us and ask for the quotation. You don't have to be the middleman. You don't have to be responsible. That's what this was. Any more questions about the library? Please check it out, guys. So this is, again, um, it's all here waiting for you in the library. Guys, we've come to the end of my presentation. There's a whole bunch more I would love to uh, talk with you about, but we've been going for over an hour now, and I haven't shut up, and I've heard very little from you guys, but there's tons of, of um, letters coming in with questions and statements that I'm gonna get to and answer for you. If you guys have any more questions or you want me to elaborate 
Yeah, yeah, I know what it's like. Um, it's funny, I had another seller that said, oh, we don't want you to come in the rain. What? Sorry, Lori, I muted you. <laughs> you had your call. Anyway, guys, 780-238-8195. Give me a call, we can have a chat about any topic. I can send you out some more PDFs. But the purpose of this, let me close by saying one thing. In 2008, 2009, when I started doing this, I would go to the real estate offices and the brokers were more than happy to have me come in and do this because I was doing it for free. I would hand out laminated documents like that one you saw with the service upgrade identification and so forth. And I would hand those out freely. I hand out my literature that I had printed because I developed this to help you guys through your day and to close deals. Now, somebody back in those years would raise their hand and say, Rob, why are you coming here doing this for absolutely free, handing out all this literature and everything for absolutely no pay? Why would you want to do that? And I answered them this way. I says, how many of you have a respected and trusted realtor, um, electrical contractor in your phone that you can phone 23 and a half hours a day and get help with quotes, uh, answers, and consultations and so forth. How many of you have that? Out of a room of 60 realtors, I might get one person raise their hand. And then I would ask the question, how many of you out there are gonna have my phone number in your phone when you walk away? Everybody's hand goes up. Guys, that's why I did this. I love working with realtors. I love solving problems and I love the interaction that I have with all of you. That's why this was done. I have a mail out list that I send out um, uh, little uh, changes and little bits of information and so forth. If you would like me to add you to my mail out list, if you're not on it already, rob at robartelectric.com. I will add you and we'll send this out. It doesn't happen very often but it is invaluable information. If there's nothing else from any of you, I would just like to close and th say thank you, every one of you for attending my um, little bit of a presentation and I hope you got some value out of it. Have a wonderful day, everyone.